Good afternoon. We're just waiting for some attendees to get into the uh, Zoom webinar and we'll start shortly. Okay, it looks like the numbers are slowing down. Um, so why don't we start? Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for this uh, session on uh, consultation on real world evidence. My name is Nicole Mittman. I'm the Chief Scientist and Vice President of Evidence Standards at CADIS. Um, this information session will provide some insights on the work that CADIS and others are doing, um, has embarked on in a learning period for RWE. Uh, and, or real world evidence, and which includes work on guidance, and which is the topic for today. Thank you to everyone online for joining us. We know how things go when you schedule events on a Friday, and a particular a Friday afternoon. So we are very pleased to see the numbers of in attendees as well. So we have three speakers today um, to talk about guidance work uh, as well. So we have Kelly Robinson, who's the Director General of Marketed Health Products Directorate at Health Canada. We have Mina Tadros, an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, and co-presenting with Mina is Kaylee Hayes, an assistant professor at Brown University. I'll turn things over to Kelly, Mina, and Kaylee in a moment, but first I'd like to provide a territorial acknowledgement. So I'm a settler and an immigrant to Canada with family roots long, a long way away from this land. Today I'm speaking to you from Toronto on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. Wherever you are today, I encourage you to give thanks to the Indigenous people who have lived here before you and who continue to live here and continue to sustain and protect the land that you, where you live and work. So maybe one last thing before I turn it over to Kelly, our first speaker. Um, I have, uh, if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand virtually or uh, put in something in the chat function. Um, and I will keep an eye out for questions, and that'll be my job as moving forward. Um, and certainly, and now, why don't I turn things over to you, Kelly? Great. Thanks very much, uh, Nicole. Uh, really happy to be here. Uh, my name is Kelly Robinson, and as Nicole said, I'm the Director General of the Health Canada's Marketed Health Products Directorate. Really happy to be here today to give you a bit of an introduction into this very important webinar on the recently released uh, draft RWE reporting guidance. And I would like to thank Kadith for inviting me to participate. Really happy to be here. I think you're all aware that RWE is an important component of Health Canada's work. And I'd like to provide you with a brief overview, just a couple of slides on how Health Canada leverages RWE and emphasize the importance of our collaborations in this space with our partners such as Kadith. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, just wanted to highlight that Health Canada has been working to optimize and leverage RWE since the launch of its Strengthening the Use of Real World Evidence Projects, which we launched in uh, 2017 under our department's Regulatory Review of Drugs and Devices or our R2D2 initiative. And as part of that R2D2 initiative, Health Canada has advanced in several areas, including our consultations with CADETH, CAIHI, and DSEN to identify existing data assets here in Canada, the establishment and engagement of joint work planning through the Drug RWE Steering Committee, which CADETH leads, but Health Canada is a co-chair, and posting a notice on optimizing the use of RWE to inform regulatory decision making, as well as our accompanying document, which is elements of RWD, RWE quality throughout uh, the prescription drug product life cycle. So how does Health Canada use RWE? Well, in our pre-market activities, Health Canada really considers RWE as part of the totality of the evidence in pre-market drug packages. And we request that sponsors who wish to use RWE, that they identify and justify the use of that RWE in their drug submission. We also um, have supported our staff by leveraging the aforementioned notices, so the, the notice as well as the company and quality document uh, so that they can use them in their work. And they use that to advise sponsors at pre-submission meetings to try and give some advice on how best to consider RWE in their submission packages. 
At the same time, we've created some internal RWE inventories um, and some standard operating procedures, which really help us sort of capture the various uses of RWE or proposed uses by sponsors and really help us inform our future guidance documents. In the post-market space, RWE is often used in signal detection or to inform our pharmacovigilance and risk management activities. And there's a variety of sources that we draw from in terms of RWE and RWD that can be used to inform these post-market surveillances, such as our environmental scanning, the different data sets that I talked about, Canada Vigilance, um, some of CADETH, uh, the work with um, PDNP, the post-market uh, drug evaluation program at CADETH, et cetera. So really lots of various sources that we're looking in that post-market space. And really looking to explore new sources of uh, RWD to continue um, to explore and expand and work with different partners um, to identify the and have sort of access to quality, quality data in that space. If we move to the next slide, which I think is my last slide. Um, oh, no, it's this one. Okay, so the just a quick note then on the acceptability of RWE in the regulatory context because we do face a few challenges uh, in this space. Um, and these really for us as regulators include understanding the source and the quality of the real world data, the validity of the approaches, these new approaches that are coming forward, the methods for processing, analyzing, interpreting and understanding this data, and the consideration of the different and diverse terminologies and guidance that people are using across various regulatory partners, as well as different regulators and different stakeholders. And so this is where collaboration is so crucial in helping us navigate the RWE space. So just wanted to highlight that as part of our numerous domestic and international collaborations, we're working to further advance key areas related to RWE and including the development and advancement of common terminology, common guidance documents, et cetera, that will really help us in supporting regulatory decision-making. So just a couple of those pieces to highlight. Um, through the participation in ICMRA, Health Canada released a joint statement on collaboration with international partners in July, 2022, which really is committed to ongoing collaboration to enable RWE for regulatory decision-making. And we're also an active participant in the ongoing development of an International Council for Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Pharmaceuticals for Use, so ICH, um, is developing a guidance on general principles on planning, design, and pharmacoepi studies that utilize real-world data for safety assessment of medicines. So those of you familiar with ICH, that would be the ICH M14 guidance. So some key international pieces that Health Canada is working on. So just in closing, domestically, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, uh, lots of collaboration with CADF because they have really been a key partner with us since our early days of exploring RWE. And just a quick example, in 2018, Health Canada CADF and the Institute of Health Economics, as well as the Canadian Association for Population Therapeutics, collaborated on defining uh, decision-grade real-world evidence and its role in the Canadian context, which was a design sprint. And that launched a series of collaborative activities to help advance the use of RWE for both HTA, but also for regulatory decision making. And most recently, the RWE steering committee, which, as I mentioned, is led by CADETH, but co-chaired by Health Canada, has been advancing a number of projects, including learning projects and the RWE reporting guidance that we're going to be hearing about today. So I'd really like to thank CADETH for their ongoing collaboration, and I really look forward to today's presentation. So th with that, I will thank you very much, and I will turn it over to Dr. Tadros. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can move to the next slide, please. Wonderful. And thank you, everybody, for uh, logging on this afternoon and, and, and the high level of interest in our work. Uh, so my name is Mina Tadros. I am one of the authorship, authorship team members. Um, and we have the pleasure today of walking you through the development of the Canadian RWE guidance uh, and discussing in, in further detail how it was developed and some points that we want to cover. So next slide, please. So for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, we want to cover the introductions of the basis of why we even partook in this work and why we launched this. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time uh, recapping the background and the purpose but more importantly, we're gonna dive into the methods uh, and Dr. Hayes will walk us through that. And then we're gonna talk about the current status and stakeholder engagement, which is one of the main reasons and the motives for today. 
how can you give feedback? This is a draft guidance that is posted for your review. Uh, and you know, a core tenant of the work that we've we've been leading uh, is ensuring that engagement is at the highest level uh, and that we have as much as the people in the RWE ecosystem in Canada being involved. And then we'll talk about lessons learned and I'll give some final thoughts and we'll talk about next steps. Next slide. So I wouldn't be an academic if I didn't opine a little bit when I have the opportunity. And so I think it's really important to take a step back and think about uh, why are we even talking today about an RWE guidance? I think we don't have to dive into the importance of RWE uh, and the excitement around it. But I think for many people, we kind of all have like a small smirk when we think about RWE uh, being something new. I think there's a long history, especially in Canada, of strong commitment and strong work and strong methods development of observational research uh, and leveraging data that comes from the real world. But why now? And I think that that's why, uh, you know, I think that's a very important question. There is sort of a moment that's ongoing globally, uh, both in the opportunity for what's happening with real world data and the explosion of data that's occurring, but also the challenges that are being faced uh, by regulators and HTA agencies and everybody in the ecosystem who's trying to better improve health technologies. And I think it's this reasoning that led us to think about this. You know, initially when we started thinking about what would need to move the dial for RWE, when the, when the movement started to begin, probably around four to five years ago, the conversation started reaching a, a good sort of plateau in, in, in excitement. I, you know, many people were, were kind of concerned, not only with the diversity of evidence, but that there would be an issue with quality you know, that there would be an issue with how it can step up and help and improve what the standards were already based on the strong foundations that RCTs had built. And you hear it time and time again, RWE is not replacing in any way RCTs. It is not here to do so. It is here to sort of augment, improve, and help fill gaps in our understanding around many health technologies. But what we quickly saw is because of that diversity in types of RWE that can be produced, the way it can be produced, and the various sorts of data, there was a real challenge to kind of create something prescriptive. And originally there was a, there was a hands-off approach to how prescriptive we can be. And I think much of that, um, you know, much of that thinking has led us to decide that there needs to be some sort of groundwork to build a foundation for core standards and how we, how we submit, produce, and evaluate some of this RWE. And that is the core central tenant of what we're presenting today. Next slide, please. So this RWE guidance's main purpose is to standardize the reporting of RWE submissions by providing best practices for reporting, highlighting important methodological considerations for those undertaking and submitting RWE studies of healthcare technologies in Canada. And next slide. As we develop these guidances, it really had multiple purposes that we understood how the utility and utilization of this guidance would be. The first is we would establish reporting standards. The second was that the core standards for decision grade RWE, which was essential to build confidence in the use, adaptation, and uptake of RWE in any regulatory or HTA reviews of any sort. We understood that we had to develop a guidance, and this is something that we're really proud of, is as the world was kind of developing many of the guidances we've seen, we wanted to develop a guidance that both took into account the various different challenges with RWE, but also took into account the full drug, the life cycle of health technologies, both from regulatory and from an HTA lens. And I think this is something as Canadians we can be proud of, that we've been able to bring multiple stakeholders to the table especially Health Canada and CADIT at once, and think about how can we produce something that is going to be a continuity. And this is uniquely Canadian, and this is honestly a really exciting moment to think about how we can be uh, thoughtful in the way that RWE is used without, throughout the health technology life cycle. And importantly, although we understand that this is happening globally, there are important Canadian contexts that we have to account for. And so within the document, you see that we try to account for that uh, and take that into account. The guidance itself has multiple target users. First and foremost, HGA and regulatory reviewers of submissions. It thinks about how submissions are going to be uh, put together. We are also are thinking about researchers and analysts conducting the RWE studies for submissions, thinking ahead of time of what would be necessary. And then employees of health technology, pharmaceutical companies, 
and contract research organizations preparing the submission. So all of these are target users who should care about what's in this RWE guidance. Next slide, please. So with that, I will hand off to Dr. Hayes, who will actually speak to us about how this guidance was put together and the process that we went through. Thanks, Mina. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so this is a really exciting process to put together this, this guidance document. And essentially the first step was to figure out what was already out there, what guidances were already saying, what the recommendations contained in them were. So to do this, we completed this mapping exercise of all the evidence um, across different real world evidence, uh, guidance, reporting tools, as well as policy statements. So anything that really had to do with real world evidence and had recommendations. And to kind of start this process, we leverage a, a fabulous um, existing environmental scan that was quite recent from Ines. Um, that really had kind of identified a lot of important documents related to real world evidence. And, you know, we, we extended the search a bit by looking um, through citations, references of the available documents and leveraging um, networks and a lot of the stakeholders already involved um, in the project to find additional papers. So essentially we had 40 documents um, to review. It was quite dense. There were two reviewers who separately reviewed um, each document to extract um, over 600 total recommendations with a third reviewer to check over the recommendations that were extracted. And these different recommendations kind of map to 16 major project or you know, study areas, things like participants, exposure measurement, et cetera. Um, and then you know, were eventually condensed into 200 recommendations. So next slide, please. And uh, to kind of bring together um, a lot of important folks in the real world evidence space to try to sort through all these recommendations and decide kind of which ones to bring forward in the pipeline, we assembled an expert panel. So the purpose of this panel was to bring in people familiar with real world evidence, um, but also who had diverse backgrounds. So the panel was two thirds Canadian and one third international. And across our, our Canadian stakeholders on the panel, we um, tried to have diverse representation across Canada geographically, but also in the types of research that um, these people specialized in and their actual disciplines. Um, next slide. And then for our international folks, um, we um, were lucky to bring in a lot of people who um, had experience developing guidelines in, or guidances or tools in real world evidence um, in other jurisdictions. Um, so ISB, ISPOR, um, EMA, FDA, NICE, um, kind of taking um, the experience of, of those folks and bringing it into this document, but also putting it into the Canadian context. And we were really lucky and we know this is really important in that no one person that we asked to be on the expert panel said no. So either peer pressure or, or this, the importance of, of kind of developing this document um, was clear. All right, uh, next slide. Um, and finally, as, as part of kind of um, observers of this expert panel, we had folks from, from a lot of major um, kind of uh, stakeholders as well. So these were non-voting members, and I'll explain kind of the voting process next. But these folks um, really kind of helped to weigh in on the process of how we engage with the stakeholders, the document uh, kind of structure, and as well as help to take notes and just try to um, understand the overall tone of the conversation and, and what was being discussed um, with the expert panel members. Numbers. Okay, next slide. So um, as I mentioned, we had 600 recommendations that were extracted from those documents. Um, and, you know, obviously there are a lot of kind of duplicate recommendations across um, different documents. So we eliminated um, ones that were duplicated, but also so that we could translate this into a survey for the experts to really go through, um, went through and tried to standardize the language um, and kind of um, make things more usable uh, for a survey format. Um, then we we created a, um, a questionnaire with about 200 recommendations, actually I think exactly 200 recommendations to send to the experts and um, each of the experts independently voted on each recommendation um, and assessed whether it was um, not very important at all, somewhat not important, um, uh, somewhat important or very important, so on a scale of one to four. And this was essentially to determine what recommendations were going to be pushed further through that pipeline to make it into the guidance. So next slide. 
And that expert panel, um, we had a threshold for each item. Basically, there had to be 70% agreement that it was either important or not important for that item to either respectively be included in the guidance or omitted from the guidance. And then those recommendations that didn't achieve at least 70% agreement um, went on kind of a list for a large group discussion so that um, collectively the group could decide on whether to keep, revise, or omit each item. Um, and we actually had two meetings because there were there were um, you know some uh, discussions that were ongoing on on recommendations on revising them specifically. Um, so we also in these um, kind of uh, large group conversations had a general discussion on just you know the scope of this type of document, um, what content should be included in general, and also just the style of recommendations and how the document was structured. Um, and, you know, we were lucky to also have a subgroup that helped go through the document with us as it was kind of forming to enhance usability and, and kind of um, kind of user test um, the recommendations as we were kind of putting them in the document. Next slide. Um, and again, so we had two large group of discussions, but also had continuous and ongoing discussions via email and asynchronous feedback. Um, and um, the internal team, you know, kind of the aggregation of the survey as well as the discussions um, resulted in the first draft of that of the actual guidance document, which was sent to experts um, in several iterations over the fall, incorporating feedback each time. And as, as um, Mina and others mentioned, uh, the draft guidance is available currently for public feedback. Um, and then uh, any proposed modifications from that public feedback will be discussed with the expert panel. Next slide. These are the 16 major sections of, of the document and really how all the recommendations were kind of mapped. And the main thing I, I wanna highlight is that there was overall um, in that questionnaire extreme high agreement um, with the experts on what recommendations should be included and not included. Um, and then there was a lot of rich discussion on the remaining um, components um, in terms of whether to revise, keep or admit them. So we had over 80% agreement on those 200 items. Next slide. And I think um, it was a really um, kind of wonderful experience and, and in-depth discussion. And there's kind of four major themes that emerged in general from, from discussion and from the questionnaire um, and results in general. So as, as Mina mentioned, um, there's really a need to establish kind of core minimum standards um, for reporting, um, but also um, important to highlight some methodological considerations that of course don't apply to every real world evidence submission, but are important nonetheless and kind of repeatedly came up in discussions and in and international and other reporting tool documents. Um, and kind of a, a core tenet of all of this is that there has to be transparency and in, um, in what is reported in a submission in order to properly evaluate it. So understanding what was done and, and when it was done is, is critical. And to enhance that transparency, a protocol, a priori decision making is really an essential tenant and uh, really helps to enhance the rigor. It's in terms of understanding um, things can change, but what changed and when did it change and why is, is critical and kind of kept cropping up in, in the, the documents we reviewed. Okay, next slide. And uh, finally, for me, is, is um, you know, the structure that we actually landed on for the document. So, of course, you know, a background section, um, and then we provide a brief overview of the methods that, you know, kind of what I just had discussed in the methods of how the guidance was developed. Um, and then each one of those um, com the components um, is divided into a separate section. Um, so each section opens up with um, a kind of a brief discussion of the importance and general definitions involved in that section, such as like participants, exposure measurements, et cetera. Um, then we discuss the specific recommendations that um, are in the document. And the written text is really important to understand um, some certain nuance and additional detail for each recommendation. Each um, chapter then closes with a summary list of the recommendations, and within an appendix is kind of the aggregation of all those recommendations in a checklist form to facilitate submission. Um, and we also, like I said, we provide detailed methods. Um, uh, that go beyond kind of that overview or what I've discussed here um, within the appendix of the document as well. All right, next slide. And uh, I will pass it back to Mina. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayes.
So as we've laid out, uh, you know, this process began in February 2022 um, and has been building throughout the, the period of time. Uh, and the, the, you know, the, the report and this for the draft for the RWE guidance itself was posted uh, earlier in November. I guess it's now December. I was about to say earlier this month, but in December. Uh, and we will be leaving it open for public consultation until January 6th. And that's when feedback will be closed. Uh, we're obviously hosting the public webinar today. And we're also doing a series of different stakeholder consultations uh, to allow to, you know, reach out to people. And, and, you know, a core component of this is that we understand the success of this document and the adaptation of it will largely be built on uh, an ecosystem approach of having everyone that's uh, at the table uh, have an opportunity to have feedback and give us feedback, especially given that there are some technical issues that we have to tackle. There's issues around data, uh, data reporting. And within the RWE space, there's not one single stakeholder that kind of has ownership of much of this. And so that's that's kind of essential to the success uh, of the RWE guidance. Once all the feedback is collated, uh, we're going to uh, put it all together. We're going to host a What We Heard public webinar to feedback summaries. Uh, all feedback will be uh, confidential. And then we will be posting, uh, you know, we'll be drafting up and updating the report based on the feedback. We'll take it back to the expert panel. And then we'll be actually posting uh, the public report in the spring uh, and hoping to unveil that uh, with the final draft being at the CADIS Symposium, uh, which will be in the spring of 2023. Next slide, please. So and importantly, like I highlighted, there's been a number of events that have occurred and a number of events that are going to occur. Uh, if there are groups and stakeholder groups that uh, have not been contacted, please reach out to us. We're happy to establish uh, group webinars. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we held a town hall prior to the launch of the stakeholder engagement. Uh, we've directly met with Health Canada, various CADF teams and committees. We've met with Ines. Uh, we are going to be meeting with IMC Biotech Canada. Uh, the RWE steering committee, this public consultation, and a number of other consultations that are happening as well. Um, and so please, you know, if there are groups that want to be consulted and want to have these conversations, let us know. But again, I, I want to make something very clear that during this process, it's to better explain, like we just did, the process, the methodology, how we put it together. But we ask that any feedback will not be sort of in speaking with people, but we ask that all feedback be submitted in writing. It allows us the opportunity to collate, compare, but also to think about what that feedback may be. And this is sort of the process that we uh, we believe will be the most constructive to allowing us to collect the, the broadest sense of feedback. Next slide, please. So again, to highlight, uh, we urge anyone who's interested to submit feedback before January 6th. In January and February, there will be a third expert meeting to review uh, the collation of all of that feedback. Final reporting and updates to the draft will be in March and April of 2023. And then the go live will be in presentation at the CADIS Symposium in May 2023. So a very tight timeline, a little over a year since the beginning of this project. Um, but as you can tell, we've been pushing forward and, and working very strongly with all our partners to be able to achieve this timeline. To, and it's a really uh, highlighting how important I think many of the stakeholders believe our, the RWE guidance and RWE is uh, to ensuring that all health technologies are, are able to adapt it if needed. Next slide, please. So again, for submitting your feedback, we ask that all feedback be submitted in writing. We assume all submissions are confidential. You can note on your submission if you wish for it not to be, uh, but we, if, if nothing is you know, written there or, or told, we will assume everything is confidential. We will summarize all feedback and post a summary document as well as having that what we heard uh, event that we will, you will be announcing in the spring. Uh, and again, we want to reiterate that all feedback will be reviewed. Uh, and we urge anyone uh, who's interested or has any feedback at all to, to please let us know and, and take this opportunity to submit it. And, and you know, there's a link uh, on the consultation website and you can submit it there. Next slide, please. One final thing uh, that I wanted to speak about before we kind of give some closing remarks here is that as you think about what feedback and you're reviewing the document and thinking about it, there are a few things that are out of scope. And I understand it's very easy to start thinking about that. We naturally in our conversations are thinking about it and they are important things to consider, but they are outside of the scope of this RWE guidance. And so, you know, although I am certain that some people will place this in their feedback, it's something that we're, it's not in the mandate for us to tackle. The first is establishing sort of minimum standards or clear decision criteria. When is data good enough? 
not just what the attributes are of good data. And I think setting that up is a very big challenge and it's something that is not in the mandate of this. There won't be a point score. There won't be a way to say this data is acceptable and this is not. And there's a variety of different reasons why this is not really approach that would be sensible. As you can imagine, data is constantly changing. There's new data coming. And this is a very big challenge that I think would hinder the adaptation and uptake of RWE. The second is information on the weight given to RWEs in decision. This is going to vary. This is not the mandate of when RWE should be, can be, and will be used. I think that you'll hear conversations from the various different stakeholders about when they were going to do that. This document is sort of putting the horse in front of the wagon. First, we need to know the core standards and methodological considerations to produce high quality decision grade RWE. And then I think many of the stakeholders will sit down and start to think about when and how they will be using it. So I think it's important to consider that this, this document will not try to think about when it's acceptable for regulatory or HDA submissions. And, and that's not really the scope of this document at all. And then lastly, I think as we were putting this together, you realize that there's much of the language is related to health technologies, and that takes a broad stroke of things from drugs, devices, and potentially other interventions that could be using RWE. So we don't have anything specific on drugs, populations, or any specific indications. There may be in the future conversations and extension documents that need to occur that tackle some of these important concepts, but this is, again, this is the first step in establishing the standards for high quality decision grade RWE. Next slide, please. So some concluding thoughts and some things to think about as you review this document. First, we recognize, and I think many people around the table, that RWD and RWE is changing fast. And so as we tried to tackle developing a document that could do this, we understood that being very prescriptive, going into many of the important details of like subpopulations, important issues with tackle, may quickly outdate this document. And really, because data is being developed on a daily basis, we see new data solutions, new options being available. The real solution to be able to make a document that will be useful and have high utility will be to think about transparency. The second point is we understand, especially for more and more rare drugs, rare diseases, specific devices, that we are going to be receiving RWE at a global level. And many of you sit at tables that are global. So thinking globally is important. And you can see that in the very way that we adapted, scanned, and included recommendations from global entities, including colleagues in the US and Europe and other international jurisdictions. And I think it's important to think globally, but also the contextualization in the Canadian local context will be important as well. And so both of these points will allow us to adapt to a fast changing world with RWE. This is again, the horse in front of the wagon. This is the first step. There will be next and upcoming steps that are outside of the mandate of this group, which is when and how to use the guidance and when and will we need to do updates and extensions. This document is not a religious document in any manner. We understand it's a living document that will need to be updated. It will need to be extended and it will need to have some work as the RWE world changes. But again, the first step is likely the most important one. And here we are presenting you guys with the RWE guidance. Lastly, and this is my soapbox moment, for Canada to really achieve and be able to make this a huge success, I think it's time to train and build capacity. We need to think about across the board, who is going to conduct, review, and use RWE? This is a massive opportunity for Canada. We have some of the brightest and best people working in this space. And I think there's a really great opportunity to tackle this and make Canada a global leader. Think, you know, The first step of thinking across the life cycle of drugs is innovative and something for all of us to be very proud of. And lastly, I think it, for us to really achieve the full potential for our patients, for including access and improving all of it, it's time to think about real public-private partnerships that allow improved access to data, improved evidence generation, and really tackling the promise of RWE. So with that, I will hand it back over to Dr. Mittman. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and uh, thank you for sitting with us as we discuss the RWE guidance. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Kaylee and Mina and Kelly for setting the stage and talking about the methods. And I'm wondering if we should just take the slide deck down. Thanks, thanks, Jose. Um, uh, just thinking a little bit around, I'm watching the question, so um, I'm sort of putting them into themes of questions. But maybe the one of the first things that I might ask is um, the learnings that you had through this project. Uh, I know that uh, this is, as you indicated, the living document. Uh, we're trying to set the 
the reporting standards, what's appropriate to think about when you're putting an RWE study together. As you were reading the 200 plus different kinds of recommendations and the different reports that are out there um, and not reinventing the wheel, what else did you learn through this process? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. And I think this is one of those exciting moments that, you know, there was a lot of pressure and why we've been pushing this so quickly through uh, and spending a lot of resources on this to make sure that we meet the timelines is that we weren't the first out of the gate. But that really allowed us an opportunity to learn from other people's, I don't want to say mistakes, but strategies of how they approach this. And as we kind of scanned major organizations, some of the best in the world documents, um, we learned from some of them. We learned that, that there's challenges with being highly, highly prescriptive, that you tie yourself down and you have to constantly be doing updates. Um, we also were able to elucidate major themes that we can pull from there. And that's where we understood that really the solution and key to all of this is transparency. I think allowing full reporting, allowing um, uh, transparency and developing protocols a priori, and some of these major themes that are being developed internationally as best standards were something that we wanted to align with. The last thing is we also understood the diversity of how RWE can be used. I think many people are thinking about this uh, just as you know, a, a, a way to evaluate effectiveness. We know there's a long history in evaluating safety of products with these, but there's also ways to think about adaptation of products, how this is going to fit into budget impact analyses, how this is going to be able to assess system readiness. Like there's so many ways that RWE can also be used. And I think it's not just thinking about the singular kind of pathways that we think about health technologies. And so the document uh, should allow the flexibility of the various utilities of RWE. And so those are kind of some of the major themes we've used that you, you probably see very strongly in the document. And we learned that by watching many of our international partners in the documents that they released prior to us. And many of them have had to go back and update them. And so we've kind of seen what those updates were. Thanks very much, Mina. Kelly, can I ask you a similar question, but from a regulatory space? Um, the ability, you know, what have you learned over this space? This is not just a uniquely Canadian endeavor. There are lots of regulators who are thinking about this space. And in fact, uh, as Mina mentioned, this is a unique opportunity for CADAS to work not only with the regulator, but the health technology assessment teams at, or organizations at the same time. The FDA came out with RWE guidance. NICE came out with our, our RWE guidance, but not as a combined. So perhaps there is the, some comment on that. Sure. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Nicole. So it is a really exciting and interesting time to be talking about RWE. RWE has, from a regulatory perspective, um, different pieces of RWE have found their way into drug submissions for many, many years. So it isn't something that is new. But what is new for us is this really sort of prospective focus on it and sort of looking at how can we take what we know is um, data that's out there and take that data and put it into a format that makes it really fit for regulatory use, fit to support regulatory decision making and how do we fit um, this sort of RWE space um, and how do we work with that into the in the regulatory uh, decision making space and so it's really um, an opportunity right now to sort of see what's happening internationally having these conversations with other regulators as I mentioned working with ICH working with other regulators across the globe to try and sort of pull together um, some common elements, some frameworks, some guidelines that really um, give the folks that are trying to pull drug submissions together, that are trying to pull a package together to support a regulatory decision, to really give them the support that they need to be able to then um, have a submission that comes forward to us where we can then look at this data, look at this evidence and see how we can base regulatory decisions on it in part as part of the bigger um, submission that's coming forward. So it really is an opportunity to have these sort of collaborative spaces. And as you know, having the conversations um, across the health system, so thinking about RWE from an HTA perspective versus a regulatory perspective, I think we bring different um, sort of needs and requirements to the conversation, to the table. And so I think it's just, um, it's sort of a, 
an opportunity to sort of leverage, as Mino is saying, what's happening internationally, think about how this works for Canada, think about how it fits with our other regulatory partners, and how do we sort of harmonize and, and move forward in this space so that we can provide really strong guidance to those, to those um, people bringing submissions forward. So I'm not sure that I've actually answered your question, but just to say <laughs> I think I think it's a great time and I'm really excited to see where we go and, and to, you know, the opportunities to actually get the comments coming into this guidance document and hearing how people are interpreting what's in the guidance document will be very helpful and informative for us as well. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to try not to take move for my moderator role, but perhaps the one thing that we are often uh, what we often struggle with uh, that's across the board from the regulator and or HTA is we take for granted what is in the randomized clinical trial, the platform, the, the consent forms, uh, the data creation forms, uh, uh, publicly posted protocols, um, you know, uh, data safety monitoring boards. All of that infrastructure is often is very clear for any sort of clinical trial platform. In the non-clinical trial space, we often are uncertain about who got enrolled. Were they allowed, were allowed to share data? Who owns the data? What's the quality of reporting? What are the kinds of outcomes? Who can actually access that information as well? So part of the reporting structures and the method structures for doing this work will allow us to, how do we actually articulate that? How do we start to talk about, um, you know, not only how clear the methods are, but actually who had access to the data or who was the funder potentially of the particular data? And I think the next stage, and I see there's a couple of questions in the chat about implementation. Um, the next stage is so each of us will take these principles away once updated based on feedback. And then we have to think about internally how to create tools or appraisal opportunities for us, right? So again, to start to think about what actually will be useful or how do we actually operationalize those principles or guidelines. Um, so perhaps there's a couple of comments on, um, there's some groups that are missing um, from the list, and I think Lori had provided some commentary in some of the questions, uh, clinician groups, uh, how do we reach out to them, and we're quite interested in meeting with clinician groups. Uh, we have Mina on speed dial, and he's doing lots of presentations for us along the way. Uh, also patient groups, we've had a, a number, we've presented at a number of different venues for different patient groups. Uh, Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, and then also we have a, 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 a patient and community advisory committee also being part of this, but we really are looking for feedback on the structure and the methods uh, on this guidance document. Uh, and then the operational piece, which will be how do we implement it into the process for not only regulatory and then or health technology assessment will be taken over by each of the respective agencies along the way. Um, perhaps maybe uh, uh, somebody highlighted that transparency seemed to be out of scope elements and predictability of return on investment to undertaking RWE for draft guidance will strongly impact its adoption. So what is the plan for addressing these critically important out of scope elements? Maybe turn it over to you first, Mina, and then- Yeah, uh, absolutely. I on. think, you know, one thing that we spent a lot of time thinking about um, and, and, and the experts were kind of loud and clear on this, was that because of the diversity of RWD that exists, and so you, we've seen a number of questions coming in about use of patient support program data, registries, um, extensions on trials, pragmatic trials. Like we could sit here all day and list all the different types of RWD. It's not just the types of RWD, it's actually the sources of them. You know, what, there was one comment about the diversity of different uh, rare diseases, dermatological conditions, and all of those may present different types of data. And so as that's being submitted, we don't want to exclude anything that might be inform, you know, inform some of these decisions and might be really important evidence that could be helped support, linked, whatever it may be. But because of that, there's no way that any reviewer who's going to see the content is going to know thousands of types of data off the top of their head. You know, some of us that are in this field and spend their time we learn and in depth maybe four or five kinds. And those are really, you know, those are very commonly used, but we don't know anything when a new data set gets linked. And so because of that, there's important components about how to report and use novel data sets. And that's just one component of it. And really it's opening up the Pandora's box of what's in there. 
How is this data collected? Whose permission was used? Are there consultations of how to use it? Are there, you know, which information is there? Have you validated missingness, the quality of that data? And then when thinking about methods, it's also a very scary place because sometimes more advanced analytical methods feel like a black box. So we want you to open up that black box and tell us, was this validated? How was it used? What's the code used in it? Now, we also understand that for some of you, especially maybe industry partners, you're not the one who has data ownership. It might be that you went to a vendor. So it's going to take people around the table understanding these standards that we need to step up and improve it. Now, when we say transparency, we don't mean that we're going to publicly post every submission. This is not what or currently happens, and it's not suddenly what's going to happen. What we mean is transparency to the between the submitter and the reviewer to allow people to see what's inside of it. And I think that's the only way to be able to assess the quality of anything coming in, and the quality is the key to making it decision grade. And without all of that, when, you know, and I've seen some of these submissions, when data comes in, I don't know what kind of data it is, my natural instinct is not to trust it. And that's what we want to break down. We want to build trust in the data and in turn have trust in the evidence. So I hope that that kind of answers some of those questions of what we try to get at. And lots of those details of how we try to tackle that are in the guidance. And I look forward to the feedback on how we try to tackle that. So Kaylee, maybe can I turn a question, that same question over to you, perhaps thinking about the, the out of scope activities or you know, how do we think about the work that we need to do and move it forward as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Mina did a great job of kind of outlining, like, just, you know, what we we wanted for this, like, first guidance document, but I think the conversations for, for future work more surround providing specific guidance on, on some types of methodological details, but what we kind of, why we put the brakes on, and I think for this first document is that the scope of real world evidence is ever changing. There's new methods. It's, you know, you know, the there were conversations on whether we should provide specific reporting guidance on propensity scores or, or something along those lines. It's something very specific. And um, I'll just say that, you know, the focus was more on, on reporting and some methodological considerations and the transparency of reporting um, the data and the steps that were taken to conduct analyses um, to allow for flexibility in the types of submissions that would be seen and understanding that this is a living document and it, and it, and it will change. But, you know, I think um, we realized more areas that we can, we can fill in in terms of methodological guidance, but that was not kind of the main focus of, of of this um, kind of core standard, more reporting focused guidance. Thanks very much, Kaylee. Um, Kelly, there's a pro uh, question about Project Orbis um, and how does that fit with respect to the RW guidance and will there be specific RWE for that particular project? Okay, so thanks for the question. So for folks who may not be aware, Project Orbis is a project that Health Canada participates in with, um, which is, and Project Orbis in and of itself is really something led by the FDA, and it's really around an opportunity to work with our FDA colleagues as well as some regulators from across the world um, on specific uh, submissions in front of us. These are our oncology submissions, and they're typically oncology submissions uh, for new and novel therapeutics. So just to give you that background, um, at this point, um, I don't know that we will have specific RWE guidance for Project Orbis in and of itself, but Health Canada, as we're moving forward with sort of thinking about RWE and thinking about RWE that is fit for making uh, regulatory decisions, um, as we're sort of developing guidance, it would be um, applicable um, something we would tr strive to do is have that guidance be applicable for all of our decisions. I think we are not quite there yet. We are very much in a space of if a sponsor comes forward and they want to talk about RWE, we're having sort of one-off conversations with those sponsors, exploring what they're proposing, thinking about quality, transparency around the data, et cetera, and how um, you know many of those concepts that both Mina and Kaylee have been talking about and how, how can we... Um, you know, have assurance around the data in terms of thinking about it for regulatory decisions. So I think in terms of specifically for Project Orbis, we don't have a specific uh, plan for RWE guidance for that specific project, but I think where you would see is Health Canada looking to prepare guidance for all of our product submissions, not just Project Orbis. I put myself on mute. That's a horrible thing to do as a moderator. 
Um, uh, there's, there are a couple of other questions, and thanks very much for putting your questions in the chat. There's one about transparency, um, and pleased to see that we're going to be releasing a what we heard document, but also transparency around requires how the submission was used or to craft a decision. So I, uh, maybe what I would highlight there, again, I'll take my moderator hat off and put on my caddis hat. Um, I think that this is actually part of how we would deliberate, and that's outside of the scope of putting these principles together. Um, that is the work that Health Canada needs to do after the principles are out. It's the work that CADIS needs to do in terms of how do you report, and also then how do you actually transparently communicate what you looked at. Uh, that's part of the waiting question that Mina said that was out of scope. It's all part of the work that is ongoing. And in parallel to this work, they're looking at um, how do we create tools and how do we appraise um, in a consistent and transparent way as well. Um, there's a couple of other questions around involving other groups and so other patient groups and other clinician groups. So uh, we'll make sure if you have suggestions on who we should reach out to, please do. Um, uh, I think part of the, one of the questions is around um, the, you know, maybe the example, Mina, I would ask you to provide is the hydroxychloroquine Lancet and New England Journal articles about the, really the idea of how do you report real world evidence? And if you could provide that example so people understand the nuance, because I see lots of the questions are coming in about when is it acceptable? Um, questions around uh, the, uh, the quality or the utility of the data. Um, and we're really talking about a specific piece of this, the methodological piece. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think that's a really great example to paint the importance of transparency and understanding quality of data that's being inputted in. Um, so if people recall, um, you know, we just, you know, very early on in the pandemic, there was a number of tweets and communications that went out about the potential for using hydroxychloroquine um, as a treatment for uh, COVID-19. Um, and in that process, a number of real world studies came out and there was two strong ones uh, that highlighted the potential and, and the effectiveness of those products in doing so. As people started to uncover what the data sources were, it ended up being that the articles were retracted and refuted at the very end. And I think that that whole process could have been uh, that you know not could have not occurred if we actually understood what this novel data set was. And what we actually found out is that you know that there was a novel data set that was proposed to be used. Uh, people were really excited to use it. It allowed access to a number of different hospitals and the use of it. And in the rush of doing things, people never sat down to look at the quality of that data. And it had never been used. It was novel. And as a researcher myself, new data sets are very exciting because they allow insights and it, perspectives and information that you may not have access to, and they fill important gaps. But the problem was that as people started to better understand what was inside that data set, they understood some major limitations and flaws that limited and actually ended up causing major issues in the analysis. And so, if, you know, theoretically, if they would have had a guidance like this, if that was a submission that had come in and we understood what the data was in there, we could have at least understood and someone could have reviewed it and understood what was happening there. But instead, it was sort of a hand wavy black box of we have this data from hospitals, trust us, it's great. And I think, again, building on the facts of trust, it was important there. And I think there's some comments and questions about, you know, what's the point of building a guidance first without knowing when you're going to use it? And this is one of those like, and that's why I kept calling this the horse in front of the wagon. And I think what we came to realize is that unless we can build documents that build the trust in why RWB can be used, um, we can't even start thinking about when to use it. And to be point blank, like when we were putting out this document and getting much of the internal feedback and the conversations and feedback I've had so far, 80% of the comments are, well, don't replace RCTs. You know, this is not going to replace RCTs. Well, I don't even know the quality of this. And I, I just want to reiterate that this is not replacing RCTs. But for us to even think about trusting it, we need to have high quality evidence. And so to even think about using this in any situation, we need to ensure that. And that's what this guidance is really trying to get at. Thanks for that, Mina. And I think also, you know, in the rare disease space where there might be limited number of individuals in our particular country, but as and we might be have, have submissions on data from other countries, you know, how do we start to evaluate that and use that particular, um, use the principles of what is actually required to get us to high quality data? There's another question around how do you see um, RWE and this guidance document being used for new drug approvals? expanding indications or decision to reimburse. Now, those are 
Actually, some of them are out of scope with respect to some of the methodological development and the standards um, around the quality. But perhaps, you know, I, I had alluded to <clears throat> earlier that there is work that will have to happen about how we implement this. And maybe, Kelly, can I turn that question over to you just to talk about the incorporation or the consideration for the regulatory space? Sure, absolutely. Thanks very much, Nicole. And it really comes back to, um, to the discussions about quality, right? So when we are making regulatory decisions, we want to know that the data that we're looking at is of high quality and is supporting sort of our regulatory thinking and our regulatory decision making. And so I think that um, very much this gives us a sort of an opportunity to look at some force principles and then to be able to use that to build upon um, to think about creating guidance for specific for regulatory submissions, um, whether that be written guidance, whether that be guidance for providing to um, uh, drug um, companies who are who are proposing to put submissions in. I think it really is about, um, you know, a starting place and ensuring that what we're building on is a, is a foundation of good quality data that we can then use and, and that really is fit for those those um, regulatory decisions that we'd be like likely liking to be using it for. As Nicole said, there is, I think, a lot of work to be done. Um, and it's certainly, um, as Mina said, is not going to replace the RTC. So um, we need to really find the space for RWE and where does it make sense and how does it then uh, support um, all that regulatory decision making. But what I'm really looking for is an understanding of the quality of that data as it comes in um, to be able to leverage it. So I, this is where I feel like this, this document is really exciting because it gives us a, a starting place, absolutely. Thanks very much for that, Kelly. So we have four minutes left, can I? Ask each of you, maybe starting with Kaylee, final thoughts on, on this particular piece of work. Thanks, Dr. McNan. So, um, you know, I guess my, my final thought as someone who was really kind of in the weeds and focusing on a lot of specific recommendations and kind of seeing the culmination and how um, engaged everyone is and kind of um, impor the importance of this document. Um, is just that um, we're looking forward to incorporating additional feedback as there's public comment. Um, and really to get to this stage was just to essentially get the evidence on methods and reporting that, that exist out there and creating it into a usable document um, with expert opinions on basically what are the most important things to consider in transparency of, you know, reporting of real world evidence. Um, but now is kind of, um, it's, it's nice to kind of um, be able to engage with additional stakeholders to understand the interpretation of these, this guidance that we've put out. So thank you very much. Thanks, Kelly. Mina? Yeah, so thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for attending and, and the great questions. I know we didn't get to every single one. So I just want to highlight that there is a chance for, uh, again, like submitting the feedback. And I urge everyone to use that. And, and, I, and I think if we didn't get your feedback, please feel free to, to contact us and, and let us know. And we'll, we'll navigate you to who can best answer some of your questions. I think for me, I, I also want to highlight that just as a closing thought that some people, as much as you can see from the timelines, like since we got the mandate to put this together and got everyone around the table, we've been pushing very, very hard to develop this guidance as fast as, you know, without, without having low quality of the development, but to do it in a way that gets this out there uh, within one year. And some people have argued that Canada's sort of late to the party, that, you know, the Europeans and the FDA kind of got to it before us. But I think what you see in our methods is a learning from others and an improvement on it, both in thinking about the full drug life cycle or the full health technology life cycle, but also thinking about how have others done it, both in the way they wrote it, the recommendations and how they've been adaptive. So what I say to people is we're not late to the party. I think we're just right on time and we're actually gonna be leading the pack in the way that we've approached this. And I'm very excited about the next steps that come after this guidance goes live. Uh, and, and I look forward to everyone's feedback and engagement from everybody and every important stakeholder. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mina. And Kelly, I'll leave the last thought to you. Oh, wow. So, no pressure. So thanks very much um, to everyone. And thank you for all your, your questions. I do really maybe want to highlight a couple of things as I'm closing. Um, one is collaboration. I think that um, this is an opportunity um, for us to do some really fantastic collaboration, um, both 
within um, sort of regulatory spaces across regulators, but also between the regulatory HTA space. And I think there's a real opportunity there and then pulling in all the experts and all the folks who have um, uh, stakeholders who have the opportunity to, to provide some, some really important feedback for us. So I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about that. I think the transparency piece around uh, RWE, and I think some of what we can pull from this guidance, I think, um, will help us move forward um, as we move on to other steps in terms of transparency um, of the data, of the evidence, and how it's used to support decision making. So all that to say, really excited uh, to see this move forward. And thanks very much for the for the conversation today. Well, and my my um, thanks to the three speakers, Kaylee, Mina, and Kelly. And thanks very much for providing the the core sort of discussion, which is around how to create these guidance documents which will need to be transparent, which will need to be operationalized, which will need to have other folks involved with the discussion as well. But this is a real opportunity for us to align and collaborate as Kelly indicated. So with that, I'll close this session. Thank you very much for those who attended. Um, uh, as always, there's, uh, you can connect with us at CADA uh, and uh, with questions or comments, but please, uh, if you have uh, discussion or comments or thoughts on the principles already or the guidance document itself, there is the, it's open for consultation until January 6th. Uh, and then this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel, I believe in a few days from now. So you're welcome to re-listen. Um, but we really do look forward to your engagement and your feedback in this public consultation period. So with that, happy Friday and thank you very much. <laughs>